Okay, I think we are live and I wanted to begin the meeting. My name is Charles Venditti. I'm a senior investigator in the NHGRI. It's my pleasure to provide a few opening remarks this morning to talk about the genesis of our meeting and acknowledge the participants and talk a little bit about the logistics. I would first like to mention how this meeting evolved. Uh, as many of the uh, audience and listeners know, the field of organic acidemia and homocysteine urease is enormous and vast. And this meeting actually derived from uh, a planned meeting that we were going to have in person before COVID with the Organic Acidemia Association, the PAF, and HCU. And during the course of the pandemic, this has obviously shifted to the virtual format. And uh, the agenda was therefore um, somewhat related to the patient meeting that we were planning over almost two years ago now. Uh, I also want to acknowledge all the organizers on the, on the team here at NHGRI, particularly Dr. Irene Minoli, Jennifer Sloan, and Oleg Shalachkov, who really have led this effort. And I want to also mention that all the speakers were very gracious to provide their acceptances nearly immediately upon invitation. And I want to also mentioned that we had a 100% acceptance rate for all of our invitations extended. So I think there's a tremendous interest in this meeting and what we're gonna talk about during the next uh, two days. In terms of the logistics, what we have done uh, with the help of the unbelievable NHGRI team of Gerald Somani, Alvaro Encina, and William Mays is to create a series of video archived talks, which we will then play and then have after the talks as uh, availability of the speakers will permit a short Q&A session. Um, there will be no formal introductions of anybody because on the website, there are extensive speaker bios. So I think I'm probably going to close my remarks in a minute here to just, again, thank everybody that's been involved with this meeting and thank all of you for your time. I know people are joining from all around the world. We have almost 500 people that are signed up for the meeting. Um, Again, the way the format of the meeting will work is the, the video will play, there will be a short Q&A session, and then it'll move to the next video. And then at the end of the day today, we will have a larger panel discussion and you can look online to see the exact agenda and the timeline. So with, without any further uh, ado, I would like to, again, thank you all on behalf of the NHGRI and on NCATS who's co-sponsoring this meeting with our team to a very exciting two days. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Charles Venditti, and I'm the senior, a senior investigator and head of the Organic Acid Research Section. And I'm delighted to be able to speak today on genomic therapies for methylmalonic and propionic acid demon. I have some disclosures related to research support from biopharmaceutical partners, which include past partners, current partners, and there are a number of patents held by the NIH on, on the behalf of our team related to some of the material which I will present today. I want to acknowledge my outstanding section. I'm delighted and honored to work with all these members every day. And together we have made great progress in the study of MMA and PA at the NIH. The, the names that are highlighted in blue are trainees of laboratory and clinical trainees. And we're particularly proud and honored by our trainees who have done great things. And are going to, some of them will speak during this symposium. To the, today, I would like to speak about two main objectives. One is to understand the rationale for genomic therapies to treat MMA and PA. And this will involve a deep exploration of pathophysiology and a review of path of, of uh, excuse me, of proof of concept studies in mice. I would then like to overview briefly the new genomic therapies that are in development and or in the clinic. This includes mRNA therapy, genome editing, and gene addition therapy with AAP. I will say a few remarks about the MMA and PA syndromes. This will be covered extensively during the symposium. These disorders are a group of inborn errors of branched chain amino acid metabolism and vitamin B12 metabolism that were first described in the 1960s. The patients have absolutely massive accumulation and excretion of disease related metabolites, including methylmalonic acid, 2 methyl citrate, and C3 species, appropriate carnitine. In the United States, babies with these disorders are detected by newborn screening, and we believe the incidence approximates 1 in 50 to 1 in 80,000. The prognosis in general for these conditions is guarded, and this has motivated 
the search and uh, assessment of new treatments for the patients. This slide is an overview of the pathway of branched-chain amino acid and organic acid metabolism. It shows the main precursors of the uh, compounds that en enter into the mitochondrial matrix and eventually will be converted into propanol coenzyme. This, in turn, shuttles through a series of reactions mediated by the propanol CoA carboxylase enzyme, which includes the PCC A and B genes slash subunits. There's a racemization step mediated by the epimerase reaction. You can see MMA being generated here by the action of the D-methylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethylmethyl
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and now talk about the enabling studies that came from mouse models to get us to the treatments that we that are gene based. I'm going to talk about a study we performed many years ago. We expressed the methylmalacone mutase enzyme in yeast. And the reason this is done is because yeast can process the leader sequence of mouse and human enzymes. And then you can make active enzyme. You don't have to worry about folding. All you have to do then is add a denosyl covalent in the dark and get active mutase enzymes, super active. So people are biochemically oriented. This is a great system to do for enzymology. We used our enzyme to go ahead and make polyclonal antibodies. And then we're able to determine the expression of the mutase enzyme in the various tissues of the mice, which is what we expected in some ways that this is expressed in the liver and the kidney and throughout the body. And again, this goes along with the fact that this pathway is probably active in many, many tissues in the body. And the question then becomes, what tissue do you have to correct at to what level to see phenotypic benefit? Now, when we first made the knockout mice and other groups have made knockout mice, and we all saw the same thing, which is severe immediate lethality in the full knockout mice on the black six background. We learned a lot from these mice. They actually recapitulate the severe human phenotype and their biochemical parameters are very close to what are seen in very, very sick uh, human patients early in life. They're difficult to study because they almost always perish by day of life, by the first day of life. Now, when we hybridized the FBBN background onto these mice, we obtained rare survivor animals that were sporadic, that could live to weaning. They had severe MMA, they had no enzyme activity, but they could live to weaning. And as soon as they were weaned to regular chow and experienced any stress, they died right away. These mice were very useful because from these mice, we learned a lot about the secondary mitochondropathy of MMA. What I'm showing you here is an electron microscope picture from this mouse that died the next day after this photo was taken. And those are the liver mitochondria. They're massively swollen and distended. The matrix is pale. You can maybe make out the crystal. And then we saw these in the mice and the tubules, the proximal tubules, in parts of the pancreas and in the liver, not in the heart and not in the skeletal muscle. And then the question became, is this what you see in patients? And the answer is yes. We were able to obtain uh, liver samples from explant, uh, at transplant from some of our patients, the precious donation that we have very appreciative of our patient population for donating these organs and studied them extensively and showed they have the exact same phenotype biochemically and morphologically of EM as mice do. So this really established a secondary mitochondropathy as part of the pathophysiology of MMA. This is very important as we think about when we're fixing something in a patient, we need to fix this. So the next thing we did was to make transgenic mice doing an add back with germline transgenes. And the way this is done is by configuring a gene to express in a specific cell type and making a transgenic animal with that and crossing that to a carrier mouse. And then by breeding, producing mice that are knocked out at the methylmalonchoid mutase locus with a rescue transgene. And you ask the question, what's the phenotype? Was it, was it rescue? So again, guided by patient observations, and by the way, this is the publisher, if you want to read the paper on this. What you can see just in the mice, and here's a rare mouse that lived to day 32. It had some FEBN genes in it. You can see it's not that healthy compared to its litter mate. Whereas you can imagine a mouse that was either going to be dead or might have looked like this. When it has the transgene, it looks like this. You almost can't tell the difference between that and the litter mate. And when we looked at the survival phenotypes of these mice, indeed, they survive weaning. And here's an example of a mice that don't have a transgene, 100% death on day of life one to two. There's mice that have a germline transgene are largely rescued, and they look basically normal. They're slightly small, and they have very high levels of metabolites in the blood, urine, and body fluids. Now, one of the first things we did with these mice to ask the question, how much protection can the hepatocyte-mediated expression of mutase confer, is to challenge the mice. And the way you do this is you put them on a high-protein diet. This is a 70% enriched casein diet. Here's an example of the heterozygote mouse showing you the electron microscope picture of its liver. Those are normal mitochondria. And you want to compare that to the litter made now that's going to be the knockout mouse with the rescue transgene. And as we expected, uh, to our delight, we saw this normal mitochondria in these mice that had massive elevations of circulating metabolites, over 2 millimole in their blood, which is what you'd see in a patient in renal failure. This is a 1,000 times the level you'd see in a normal mouse, yet these mitochondria were completely normal, the cells were completely protected by a very low level expression of the mutants. And we measured the ETC in these mice as well, and it was totally normal. So they don't have a secondary 
defect that we could only measure enzymatically. These mice are completely protected in their parasites. Now, what happens to the kidneys? Well, in these same mice, I'm showing you now the, the EM of the proximal tubule. Here's the brush border, and there's the EM of the proximal tubule in the control mouse. And then there's the litter mate. That's an eaten mouse that gets the high-protein diet. And you can see it's completely abnormal. There's a mitochondropathy and a tubulopathy in these mice, which we extensively studied in this paper, including performing single nephron GFR measurements. So this tells us a bit about autonomy. We must protect the liver. We must correct the liver. But we have to be mindful that there's other organs that can still be affected. So we have to consider this when we think about treatments. And that's a blow-up of what those mitochondrial remnants look like in the tubules. Grossly abnormal. That same mouse had normal liver hepatic mitochondria. So in an extension of the autonomy model, we made another mouse model the same way with add back of biotransgene into the germline of a, of a uh, transgene that expresses only in the skeletal muscle. Or, so I should say largely in the skeletal muscle. This is the mouse creatine kinase promoter. It's insulated. It's the same strategy. What one does is produce knockout mice that have the transgene and ask the question, what's the phenotype? Well, there's rescue from lethality. And there's tissue-specific expression of the enzyme, and what I'm showing you here is this only expression of the mutase enzyme in the skeletal muscle extracts. And the mice have a severe phenotype. And here's an example of mice that are fed a high-fat, high-protein, uh, excuse me, high-calorie diet their whole lives. There's the mutant mouse, and there's its obese litter mate. They seem to be protected from obesity. They're eating. Uh, and it's not that they're running around the cages with hyperactivity. They're not. This is part of the physiology. They're runted, like patients uh, have growth problems. Mice have the same thing. And in the same set of experiments, we were able to find FGF21 as a very important and predictive biomarker of the hepatic function of the hepatic mitochondriopathy of MMA. And what I'm showing you here is that this paradoxical response is what was further studied in this paper, where when you take a heterozygous animal, fast the mouse, the normal response is to have an increase of FGF21 from low levels to higher levels. And in these mice, they have massive elevations at baseline. And then when they fast, instead of going up, they go down. That's a paradoxical response. So using this approach, we identified a number of hepatic biomarkers and validated them in, patient and in our patient population. So with that as a background of the models, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly now review where some of the studies have been performed. With mRNA therapy, I'm mentioning this one here for propyl coa carboxylase uh, deficiency. I'm not going to talk about the details of this study, but there's an open-label study of this. There's the clinicaltrials.gov entry. The next one that it was active uh, is clinicaltrials.gov entry for genome editing with using AV, which I'll talk a bit about. And then the last one is systemic mRNA therapy for mRNA. This just became active. There was a previous clinical trials entry. It was, it was entered, then it was, then it was uh, inactivated, and now there's a new name of the RNA. It, was, uh, it had a different number. Uh, so we don't know exactly what the difference is between this RNA and what was published, but there's now this study that you can see. It's recently active in clinical trials that are. Okay, let's start off with the mRNA therapy since those were the ones, papers that came out first. The way this works is a lipid nanoparticle is formulated in a proprietary fashion, and inside of it is packaged an RNA, which has a 5 prime one translated region, and then the ORF of interest, the open reading thing, either MMUT or in the case of propanyl coa carboxylase, PCA and or B. And then there's a 3 prime uh, region, which has regulatory elements, polydemylation signal. This then is formulated into these lipid nanoparticles which are then injected into the mice by systemic delivery. And the question is, what is the effect on the phenotype? In, in the first studies we were performed with Moderna, we used uh, MCK mice, those ones I talked about that I have a muscle transient, and I'll show you just a little bit of data on those mice in a second. There were follow-up studies that the company did with yet another different, two different models, a mildly affected MMA mouse model and a more severe model, an MCK model. And there was yet another study, which I will not review, using a dual mRNA approach to treat very mildly affected mice with propion calcidemia, and that was published recently as well. And I've provided the citation here for people who want to look at that paper. Maybe. I'm going to give you an example of the study that we performed that we knew right away that there was biologic effects of the mRNA therapy in our MCK mice. And the way this worked was we had a small number of mice. We gave them a, a reasonable dose of the uh, mRNA therapy by retroorbital route, which is a systemic delivery method. And what I'm showing you here is a Western bonnet from these mice after 72 hours. And normally there would be absolutely no enzyme expressed here in the liver. And you can see how these mice have quite a bit of uh, mutate enzyme. Within a short amount of time, they had a brisk biochemical response. Their serum MMA went down almost in order of magnitude. And they had a, a oxidative response as well. So what this does is it measures the ability of the animal 
to oxidize C13 propionic acid into C13 CO2. This is a very physiologic assessment of liver, liver hepatic mutants function. What you can see here is after therapy, only a few days after therapy, the, the mice now are oxidizing much more than they did at baseline. Not quite as much as a normal mouse, but they have really improved oxidation. So there were lots of other studies done in this publication, very nice studies looking at the dosing intervals and doses needed to treat the mice. And it's been published, but to just show you an example, the reason I'm going through this is the power of the mouse models to help figure this out quickly. Is it going to have an effect? And so you can see this strong effect in the mice. There's also a weight gain effect that can go with these mice when they're treated longer. I'm not going to review that. It's published in the, in the papers. Now I'm going to move on now to talk about the AV mediated nucleus free genome editing for mud MMA. Again, this is a technique that uses AAV to, and the natural cellular machinery to insert a therapeutic transgene at the very end, right before the stop coder of, of albumin. So what happens here is the AAV comes in as a donor cassette, homologous recombination, then leads to the production of a recombinant allele in the cell. This is editing. So this is a permanent correction to the hepatocyte. Where what, what happens then is at the end, the last exon of albumin then now produces a, uh, a fusion RNA that includes a 2A peptide, which allows a ribosome skip from the end of the stop codon of albumin to the beginning of the mutase enzyme. It adds a proline on, by the way. It's not always uh, remembered by everybody, but in this case, it's okay, because that is removed upon importation of the protein into the mitochondria. And so what's left here is a mark. This is a permanent mark where albumin now has 2A on it, this remnant from the virus, but it's a circulating biomark. And then the mutase enzyme then it will then be released to the mitochondria, and it will function. So we were very excited in early days because we looked at mice that we treated as neonates and saw this pattern. So you see here, this is a, a mouse that's 15 months of age, and these brown patches are all patches where there's been edited. And the reason we're excited is because when we looked at the wild-type control, we saw very limited expansion of the cells, which is what you, this is what you would expect. This suggests integration, a growth advantage due to correction, which is exactly what we ended up confirming by many, many other studies in, an, in the MCK mouse model. And what I'm showing you here is a picture from that hepatology paper we recently published that shows over time an increase, and these are the brown patches over here, these are corrected cells, the increase in the number of cells over time as the mice age. And that's accompanied by a signal with the protein as well. So this really shows over time you're getting more and more cells corrected. And this could help with a editing approach that without nucleases is very inefficient. The other thing that is useful about this approach as I alluded to is you can use the 2A peptide to make a biomarker of albumin that's been modified and use that as a circuiting biomarker to tell you about correction. And you can see what's happening in these mice that are corrected over time. They're increasing the levels of AL2A. Now it's only a small percent of the total amount of albumin, but it does raise the question of what could that do? We could talk about the Q&A perhaps. So that's where this is coming from. So the last group of therapies I'm gonna talk about are the ones that are the most effective in the animal models. These are the therapies that can rescue the sickest mice quickly and have durable effects. And, and uh, Dr. Chandler, so remember the team is gonna talk more about this later, but he really produced a number of very fine papers showing this really, really is effective in very sick mouse models of MMA, full knockout mice. And that really, I can just show you a picture of this. This is sort of what it looks like. Here's one of that, that sick mouse I showed in May to day 32, some VFEBN genes in this mouse. But when you compare the way, say, this mouse would look to a mouse that was received AB as a neonate, this is what got was very exciting. These mice almost look normal. They're slightly smaller than the litter mates. They have very high circulating metabolites. They're incredibly robust in terms of phenotypic correction. And this is what has constantly led us back to canonical AV as a what we think a very uh, effective treatment for patients. It's very, very potent in mice. So I'm not going to review all the studies, but to show where we're sort of the current studies and some of the more recent ones that are in process of publication, we've compared a number of different vectors that have different capsids either a V8 capsid or a capsid called ANK80, ancestral serotype 80, and made either liver-specific or ubiquitous promoted cassettes and given those to the uh, mice MOS models I talked to you about earlier. And in the case of the MCK MOS model, it's very effective. What we can see here is we treat these mice with a reasonable dose. It's a 5 e 12 genome copies per kg in the mice, which is a modest dose, lower than some patients are getting, for example, current gene therapies for inverners and metabolism. The mice have a quick response and a durable response with the serum MMA being really well-controlled 
and also the response of the biomarker FGF21. In these mice, we can also look at the durable response of propionate oxidation, which what I'm showing you here is label recovery in a bunch of mice that knock out mice that don't have any AV, excuse me, controls compared to mice that don't get an AV, and then sort of this group of mice, mice compared to mice that were treated with the AV, you can see at 12 days with either AV, AV, or gating, or even as much as a year, they have almost normal propionate oxidation. That's the physiologic measure of hepatic function. And you can see when we take their livers out, it makes sense. They have a lot of immune re reactive enzymes, even as long as one year after a single dose of AV and these mushroom dose the juveniles. By the way. The last thing I'll mention very quickly, because there'll be another talk on this, is the page GT effort, which we're delighted to be working with in, in a joint endeavor with MCATS. And through this endeavor, we've developed treatments for PCCA and are working on gene therapy for limited B deficiency. These will be covered later on in the symposium. But again, it's using an AAV9 vector. So I will close with this one uh, table summary for the group in the audience, which summarizes the newest therapies. There's mRNA therapy for MLUT deficiency and PCCA deficiency. It's an IV delivery route. It's going to require and repeat IV infusions, like an enzyme replacement therapy. It's a nanoparticle mediated delivery approach, and, and it is mainly dominated by the effects of this particle in the liver. Are there side effects? Could there be? Yes. The approach of gene ride, again, is a AV approach using the LKO3 serotype. It's a one time infusion. There's targeted integration of the mutase enzyme into the albumin locus mediated by AV and natural HR. A patient has been treated a few weeks ago. All we know is the name, some basic information about the patient. We don't have any other information other than the patient has mutase deficiency. Could there be side effects with this treatment? Yes. The last group of treatments that is not there yet, but will be coming, I predict, use canonical AV, different serotypes. It'll be delivered by IV. It's going to be a one-time infusion. It's a gene addition mechanism. And depending on how the AV is configured, this could express in other tissues, like the muscle and the heart, maybe even the kidney, maybe even the brain. So that's a real advantage of this. Could there be side effects of this, uh, this type of a treatment? Yes. I would suggest that maybe in the Q&A, we continue to explore these treatments, the pros and cons, what possible side effects could be as part of the discussion if the audience was interested. With that, I will close and again, show a picture of sort of my wonderful colleagues who, this picture, believe it or not, was taken in 2019 late fall, which is sort of like the last time we got together in some ways as a group before COVID. Um, and again, lots of our, our trainees. This is Dr. Pam Sarahed, she's gonna be speaking later. And with that, I would, Thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to the Q&A session. Um, hi, Jack. So we have a couple of questions. So targeting the liver only, all these therapies that we presented are targeting only the liver and will have a partial uh, correction. Is that going to be enough for clinical uh, improvements? And how about the extrahepatic organ complications? Right, so that's an excellent, an excellent question. Just to rephrase, is correcting the liver enough? Yeah. Uh, and and there, there will be a sort of a discussion of this as well for obviously the use of a liver transplant. What we know from the mouse models and from the clinical phenotypes is that the liver dominates the phenotype. So certainly hepatic correction is absolutely essential for any new gene-based treatment. What we know from the mouse model studies, we have a model of what we call conditional autonomy. So it could be, and this remains as an unknown, that there is a threshold effect where a certain level of metabolites in the tissue that's deficient of the enzyme is needed to produce pathophysiology in that tissue. For example, in the proximal tubule. We know this in the mice because when mice, again, in the mouse models, at lower levels uh, without a dietary stress, there's a mild change of the kidney, but it's, you know, it it's, looks nothing like uh, occurs when the mice get challenged. And again, the extension to the patient population would be, and again, this topic might come up with Dr. Valkley's talk, uh, liberalization of diet um, after transplant. Uh, we certainly think this is something that has to be very, we have to be very cautious about for a number of reasons. So can we just correct the liver and, and fix the condition totally? No, 
Can we correct the liver and provide a huge therapeutic effect overall to the patients, potentially with their quality of life, diminished ability, uh, diminished uh, crises, frequencies, possibly slightly better growth in other aspects of, uh, you know, of health? Yes. And so, again, without the need for medicines, this is what we think that uh, the, the liver transplant, the post liver transplant state, and again, this is a talk that's coming up next, um, is influenced by in, in pay, all the patients I know. Um, substantial need for immune suppression and a lifelong regimen of immune meds with risks that are associated with those. So just as a, that doesn't fully speak to the comment of is, is the liver enough, but that, that would be my, my short answer. Another Thank quick you. question maybe, can the mRNA therapy be a bridge before the liver transplant? Yeah, so this would be a theoretical question about whether or not patient that needs a liver transplant as an infant is very sick, could they get mRNA therapy and then switch over to another another, you know, either liver transplant or something else. Uh, theoretically, I think the, the answer to that is yes. I think we should also be cognizant of this in our discussions of side effects because a patient who is immune naive to the enzyme and receives a large amount of, of active enzyme in the form of mRNA, could that patient then be set up to have an immune response to the transgene, that is the mutase enzyme? And so akin to the lessons from ERT, would this be something that could sensitize a patient and make them prone to an immune reaction against, again, maybe an organ that expresses or a gene therapy? The answer is unknown because in the mouse models, the mice always had expression of some residual enzyme either in their muscle or as a transgene. So the mice in some ways would not be able to recapitulate this immune effect. But whether it could be done in theory, I believe the answer is yes. The practical side related to the immune response and the uh, clinical responses, that is going to remain under investigation. And uh, I think we are, it's time to move maybe to the following speaker and okay. we have more questions for later in the panel discussion. Uh, we will hear Thank next you. from uh, Dr. Buckley, uh, the Chief of Medical Genetics and the Director of the Center for Rare Disease in the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, who will be talking on the role of liver transplantation in the treatment of methylmalonic and propionic acidemia. Thanks for the uh, introduction, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to do this uh, virtually. Uh, hopefully, the next time uh, we have one of these meetings, we'll be able to do it in person. Um, uh, but as noted, I'm going to be talking about uh, liver transplants for inborn errors of metabolism, and I'll focus in the last half of the talk uh, specifically on uh, PA and MMA, which is a, a relatively newer use of the uh, technology. Just to start off with my uh, disclosures, uh, research funding and consulting for a variety of biotech uh, companies and biopharma companies. And, and we'll, we'll Let's start off by asking some questions, uh, and, and this will really frame the discussion for today. Um, first, are, are non-life-threatening diseases candidates for transplant, or are you, do you really need to literally be doing them for life-saving purposes? Um, can a transplant be considered a legitimate partial treatment rather than a cure? If you don't fix everything, is it still okay to think about it? How should we best determine optimal timing for a transplant? Uh, infancy, early childhood, adulthood, uh, and when does the benefit outweigh the risk? That ultimately, of course, is the is the is the driving uh, decision making uh, uh, calculus for doing a liver transplant. As as we look at liver transplant, let's take a step back and talk about options for metabolic therapy in general. Um, first of all, uh, augmenting a missing enzyme um, is, is the goal of, uh, of, of liver transplant, but it's also the, the goal of gene or cellular therapy. It, it is accomplished through enzyme replacement therapy or enzyme substitution therapy, and small molecule chaperonins can allow um, mutant proteins to fold uh, and to some extent re re refer, um, uh, restore uh, enzyme activity. 
you can reduce the substrate going through the enzyme so that you don't accumulate the, um, the, the, the uh, toxic compounds that uh, are as a result of the enzyme block. Uh, the classic way of doing this is dietary uh, or environmental manipulation, uh, but there are a number of um, uh, molecules uh, in, in um, under study and one in clinical trials uh, that uh, allow this for uh, PA and MMA. And then, of course, you can get rid of the things that are toxic. And, and we don't have really good ways to do that for uh, MMA and PA or most, most organic acidemias. Uh, we use carnitine and isovaleric acidemia. Glycine is, a, is an option. Uh, and if uh, in, in, in urea cycle defects, uh, ammonia conjugating agents are, are, uh, are useful. Uh, not so much in, in organic acidemias because of the mechanism of generation of the ammonia uh, really responds to the um, uh, to other therapeutic uh, interventions. So why a liver transplant? Well, in some disorders, uh, liver transplant really is life-saving. Um, in urea cycle defects, some of the most severe uh, forms of those, uh, it, 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 children just can't survive much beyond a year of age without a liver transplant. Um, it certainly is life altering. Um, so even if um, the, 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 the disease uh, might not be, uh, it, it might, might be compatible with life with uh, significant uh, 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 therapeutic interventions, uh, th those interventions oftentimes are very difficult to follow. And so uh, it, it, uh, having a liver transplant can relieve that. And then the end result of that is that it's an, an improved uh, life. Um, so let's talk about um, the, the, the things that we should consider in the context of a liver transplant. Obviously, mortality and survival. Um, if the risk of a liver transplant outweighs, uh, or is less, I guess is a better way of saying that, uh, than, than, than the risk of dying from your disease, then a liver transplant is a good option. Um, but as we've already started to discuss, uh, if the morbidity of the disease is high and the liver transplant reduces that, um, it's, it's, uh, it's worth thinking about. Uh, similarly, if, if uh, any non-transplant therapy that you might use has morbidities associated with it, then maybe the liver transplant is better than that. Um, the effectiveness of non-transplant therapy is, 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 is really probably at the crux of most of what we're going to be talking about here. Um, and, uh, and, and so if the liver transplant does a better job than standard of care, another reason to think about the liver transplant. Um, and, and ultimately, um, all of these uh, um, issues related to morbidity of the disease and therapies impact the quality of life. And so um, the bottom line for, for a liver transplant is if we think it's going to improve uh, your quality of life, then it's worth, it's worth considering. The um, liver transplants were, were first used for, for uh, urea cycle defects among the, the, the inborn errors of metabolism. And that was because, as I mentioned, uh, it was really impossible for children with ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency or very severe uh, carnitine, um, not carnitine, uh, carbonyl phosphate synthase deficiency uh, to survive much beyond six to 12 months of age um, with medical therapy. And so a liver transplant was life uh, 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 saving in those individuals. Um, however, oh, probably 20, maybe even 25 years ago now, um, uh, our, our center first began looking at the, the possibility of doing a, a, a transplant for patients with maple syrup urine disease. And the, um, uh, in, in conjunction with the Clinic for Special Children in Lancaster, the, the recognition uh, was, was uh, uh, starting to, to be made that these patients, even though they were on metabolic therapy, dietary therapy uh, that, that, uh, that kept them from uh, the worst of their, their, of their uh, metabolic uh, um, uh, symptoms, they weren't doing as well as we would like. Um, so uh, our, uh, several years ago now, uh, probably 10, yikes, it's a long time, uh, the, the, our, our, uh, our, our transplant group looked at uh, 37 uh, MSUD patients 
uh, and, 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 and many of these were, as I mentioned, were in conjunction with the, uh, the Center for Special uh, Children in Lancaster. And, and was, was able to show that, that the majority of those patients uh, had uh, IQs or adaptive uh, uh, measurements uh, that were lower than normal. So anything in this quadrant here is, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, below the mean, and anything uh, in this quadrant uh, is, is uh, considered intellectually disabled. And, and even down here, these individuals have pretty significant uh, intellectual um, uh, challenges. It really didn't. So, so our, our our standard of care therapy wasn't doing what we had hoped it would for these patients, um, and and uh, and and so liver transplant was uh, was 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 started. Um, one of the things that was important to recognize uh, and and was was obvious in these thirty seven patients was that it really didn't matter. Um, uh, what uh, age you were transplanted at, um, the, the, the opportunity uh, for, um, for, for, for doing that was, uh, was, was um, un unrelated to uh, either the IQ or the adaptive score. Those individuals uh, uh, fell across the spectrum. And that over time here, one and three year follow up, individuals uh, with MSUD who had a transplant um, were uh, had had their had their cognition um, stabilized, uh, and and so uh, the idea that that uh, doing this sooner rather than later, rather than waiting for damage to occur, uh, was 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 probably a good thing. Now I mentioned uh, the urea cycle. Um, Disorders, and this comes from the Urea Cycle Consortium in a, um, an article published by Kravitsky and, and, and Pediatric Research in 2009. And, and uh, looking at the natural history of the patients accumulated in their uh, registry, um, what you can see is individuals with early onset disease, um, the vast majority of them had some intellectual challenges. Uh, later onset disease, they did better, but there's still about two th uh, a third of them had had um, uh, uh, difficulties. Broken down by uh, disorder, um, the the um, uh, be because patients with OTC deficiency were getting early transplants, they seemed to do relatively well. Um, though they also had some challenges because of, of, uh, of early onset uh, episodes of, of uh, hyperaminemia, whereas some of the later onset diseases um, had, had um, um, more intellectual uh, disability, uh, largely because we weren't transplanting those. So this actually led uh, a, 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 a relative change in the field uh, to considering transplanting these patients, uh, which we thought were uh, able uh, uh, better able to be managed medically uh, and, 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 and instead go ahead and transplant them. Um, so the, 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 the question really uh, that, that we're, we, you have to ask in this setting is, is a liver transplant inevitably all or nothing? Uh, it, it's either life-saving or, or you don't do it. And, and I, I think you could probably uh, guess uh, by, by uh, uh, most of my introductory comments that, that I don't think that's the case. And I'm going to show you some data um, focusing on um, the uh, morbidity related to liver transplant uh, and the outcomes in, in uh, specifically our patients with PN and MMA uh, that uh, will we'll come around uh, to, to the end to give you some, um, uh, I hope, a better understanding of, of how to make a, a decision on that. So if you look uh, worldwide uh, from about the mid 80s until uh, uh, or near the end of the 80s to the end of uh, the, 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 the second decade of the 2000s, uh, um, the uh, worldwide, um, there there were uh, almost six thousand patients with what were described as uh, metabolic liver diseases transplanted. Now, some of these uh, fall into what we would normally consider uh, 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 metabolic, but but some of them are are things that that we don't really um, 
usually think about as, as metabolic. But you can see here for organic acidemias, um, overall in, in that, uh, what is that, a 40 year time frame, uh, 129 patients were transplanted with organic acidemias. Uh, of those, the vast majority, 120, um, were, uh, were children. Um, this is the, 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 the scorecard at uh, Children's here in, in, in Pittsburgh uh, from a, a, a similar range, a little, little bit longer uh, range. Um, and you can see that in that time frame, uh, we transplanted 283 patients. The definitions of, the, um, the, tra of the, the liver disease were the same as in that previous chart. Um, and what you can see uh, is that um, in, in that, in that time frame, um, we transplanted seven with propionic acid and nine with methylmalonic acidemia. And that was really all probably within the last 10 years. There may have been somebody very early on in that, but, but this is a, a relatively um, a new phenomenon for, for those, two, uh, those two disorders. Now, what's the outcome in those liver transplants? Because that really drives what we um, are going to um, uh, 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 recommend in terms of liver transplant for the for these disorders. Uh, you'll, you'll see very different data if you look at adult liver transplant and even some of the uh, um, non-metabolic liver transplant data in, in kids. Uh, and, and, and that is that the survival um, here overall in kids, for example, um, is, is, um, uh, uh, it, it's made worse if you have systemic disease, so things outside the liver. That's not too surprising. Um, and, and then um, if you have, um, uh, not, either don't have a systemic um, uh, uh, disease uh, uh, and it's and it's uh, and or you have some limited uh, uh, extra hepatic um, symptoms. Uh, the the survival is much higher, and and this is the the, the majority of our patients. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you this number here, which which looks like you know maybe eighty to ninety percent, um, and then uh, compare that uh, to. Our numbers. This is a slightly different age, uh, a time range than I showed you before. So it's only 270 uh, patients, um, but ours look pretty similar to that uh, overall, 80 to 90 percent. But what you have to keep in mind um, is is that in the early days of liver transplant, not so, not too surprising. Um, here in the blue line in the 1980s, if we break our liver transplants of children's down by decade, um, what you can see is that the mortality um, was um, was was much worse in the 80s that in the 90s and that in the in the uh, since the the, the 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 turn of the century um, really liver transplant uh, the, the long term survival um, and uh, is is um, um, and now uh, really closer to 95% uh, and and maybe even 97% um, when you take into account children who um, Come in and are are not in a, 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 a acutely ill for uh, for some reason. In other words, their disease has progressed to the to the point where that transplant is being done um, in a in a semi urgent or, or emergent uh, 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 fashion. Um, let's let's look at MMA and PA specifically. Um, so we know that the natural history of this disease. Is it has a significant morbidity and mortality. Um, what does liver transplant offer? Well, this jumps to the end of the of the of the um, uh, this section, and I'm going to put these up here first so that you can take a look at them as we go through the data. Uh, the benefits. Um, it it uh, it does decrease the frequency of metabolic episodes. I I would say that metabolic episodes are rare with uh, a liver transplant, uh, as opposed to relatively common with without it. Uh, in propionic acidemia, it improves cardiomyopathy. There often is residual disease, um, but that disease is is much better. Um, and uh, while we don't know how quickly it's going to progress. Uh, most of our patients, though not all, um, have uh, not uh, uh, experienced uh, significant worsening of their of their um, uh, 
uh, uh, heart disease post liver transplant. Uh, it improves protein tolerance. Um, and uh, there does appear to be neuroprotection. We all worry about an MMA and PA, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the metabolic strokes. And there, there, there have been um, isolated case reports of that happening post-transplant, but the, uh, the, the, the incidence is much, much less than before liver transplant. Um, there are still some uh, residual problems. We, we do end up recommending mo some protein restriction for most of our patients. However, I'll say that not all of them listen. And so we do have patients who are on a completely normal diet and, and, and doing fine. I mentioned the, the, the continued risk for metabolic stroke, though it's low, probably a percent or two kind of maximum. Um, and and uh, there have been some reports of, of pancreatitis recurring in patients uh, post-transplant, probably because of local toxicity uh, um, or as opposed to systemic toxin circulation. Uh, let's look at the biochemical parameters in, 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 uh, in, in PA and MMA. First of all, um, in, a, in our cohort of patients with MMA, and, and these were published back in uh, 2018, um, you can see that, that in general, the serum glycine level, an indicator of, of uh, methylmalonic acid, um, is, is, uh, 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 drops um, um, significantly, as does the serum methylmalonic acid. It doesn't go down to normal, but in general, it drops by two orders of magnitude. So usually uh, 50 to 100 fold lower uh, in, in, uh, in, in after liver transplant. Um, ammonia is not a big problem in a lot of patients, but it is in some. And, and so it tightens up around the normal range um, uh, after transplant in PA uh, and in, uh, and in uh, MMA. And if you bunch them all together, uh, you can see that uh, the, 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 the change is indeed statistically um, significant. And um, uh, not all patients with PA and MMA have elevated lactic acid um, prior to transplant, but if you do, it tends to normalize. So you can see here um, in, in um, uh, it's, it's uh, um, uh, lower in, in patients with late propionic acidemia uh, than it is in uh, individuals with, uh, with early. Uh, and, uh, and if you bunch them all together, uh, post-transplant, it, to, uh, it tends to drop. Hey, this uh, is a, a table that from that same paper that I mentioned uh, from 2018 uh, that just summarized the, the then experience with PA and MMA. And you can see this is a lower number than I mentioned in the previous uh, chart. But you can look at these and, 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 and see that uh, there were, there were uh, relatively few um, uh, uh, surgical problems here um, that uh, everybody has a little bit of, of rejection that's sort of standard and, and wasn't any worse in the, in the PAMMA patients. Um, the echocardiogram in our, in our um, uh, PA patients, uh, one of them completely normalized, three of them still had some residual disease, but it was much better than it was before. No problems with kidney disease. Uh, these were isolated liver, not liver kidney. Um, and uh, while everybody here is listed as being on dietary restriction, actually some of these patients had stopped it on their, on their own. Um, this is one of those charts you're not really meant to, to, to be able to read because it's, uh, it's, it's too small, uh, but it's just there to remind me to talk to you about living related donors. So, you know, for, for, uh, as long as, uh, uh liver transplants been out there, uh, we've, we've used, um, uh, cadaveric donors and now we're moving to, uh, living related donors. Uh, and, uh, and, and in many cases, um, that is, uh, uh, um, uh, we, 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 we have to make sure that the, um, the, the donors are not carriers for the disease, i.e. the parents are not candidates. Um, but in the case of MMA and, and, and PA, it actually turns out, out that that's okay. Um, and uh, and, and uh, we've, we've done a number of parental to child uh, donations in, in PA and MMA, um, and it seems to work okay. Um, uh, here um, you can you can see that um, uh, 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 the 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 um, um, uh, heterozygous donors have have been have been uh, have been used. Um, 
Domino transplants are also used in this, uh, this disorder. Um, you can take, for example, the liver from an MSUD uh, patient and give it to a patient with MMA or PA. It actually blocks the, 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 the flux of amino acids, isoleucine and leucine, um, uh, 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 through, the, through the pathway. Uh, and and uh, uh, some of our best patients post-transplant were in this category. Um, there are a number of other diseases that have been used. Have, have, this has been done with, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. Um, and, uh, and here you can see um, a report of of, of uh, one uh, PA patient um, who uh, who uh, the isoleucine and leucine levels. The cat, the one of the the um, uh, unveiling the the, the 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 amino acids that are are usually high in patients with MSUD or in the normal range in our in in the PA and, and MMA patients. They have the normal um, uh, uh, metabolism of these amino acids in the rest of their body, and so they can handle those amino acids just fine. Um, so some of the additional considerations when we think about um, uh, uh, liver transplant in, in, in PA and in MMA is, are we doing isolated liver or do we need to do a liver kidney transplant? Uh, this is in MMA because PA, you don't really have um, uh, a, a kidney disease. And so really the definition here uh, or the decision here is based on whether there's current kidney disease Usually, you do. You would include a liver uh, a kidney. You do a liver kidney transplant, or if it's predicted to be uh, uh, developing liver disease in in the in the um, uh, near future. Um, talking about living related donors, I still think that non carriers are best, but parent uh, a carrier uh, transplants have been uh, uh, have, have worked out just fine, as have the uh, uh, domino transplant. Um, and then uh, just to, to say one more time, transplant in this disease is not a cure. You may need diet. We still have to watch out for, for, for symptoms. Um, and many of those uh, symptoms may be released, uh, may be uh, uh, um, improved with other adjunct uh, therapies. So keep an eye out for clinical trials. Um, uh, in, in that setting. Um, uh, you'll hear about gene therapy elsewhere in this uh, session so, or in this, in this meeting, so I'm not going to talk anything about that. Um, so where do we go next? Well, we have more than, than, than one option, and, and, that, uh, and, and that's a good thing. Um, so you should be talking to your metabolic physicians about whether transplant is right for you, um, dietary therapy is better, or some of the other uh, gene therapy or, or small molecule therapies um, that, are, that are coming down the, down the pike. Uh, bottom line is that in PA and MMA, we're really rethinking the paradigm. Liver transplant helps, it doesn't completely fix, but that's okay and, and may be good enough um, for, for uh, your needs uh, or your child's needs uh, for, for this disease. Um, so with that, I'm just going to thank my lab and my clinical research team uh, and, and you uh, for listening. And uh, I think we'll be coming back live as soon as this uh, video is over for some questions. Thank you very much. Again, um, unfortunately, Dr. Vokley had an emergency this morning that kept him from being able to join us live for this uh, short Q&A. Uh, so I will, uh, we will move on with uh, our next speaker, uh, Patrick Forney. Uh, he is a clinical and research fellow at the Division of Metabolism in the Children's uh, uh, Hospital of Zurich in Switzerland with a longstanding focused interest on MMA. And he will uh, present on the updated clinical guidelines for the management of methylmalonic and propionic acidemia, and uh, as well as his latest work on some omics uh, uh, approaches to identify new novel therapeutic targets. So we will hear from Patrick next. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some of our work today. In the first half of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, the first guideline revision on methylmalonic aciduria and propionic acidemia. And in the second half of my talk, I'm going to present a current study we're performing on the MMA. When presenting this first revision of the guidelines, I will basically give you an insight into the process of how this development uh, runs. Um, I won't be able to go into the details of every single recommendation, but I'll provide 
um, some more maybe controversial uh, uh, recommendations, which will be the basis of some discussion later on. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to, to disclose. And I'm starting with this very basic slide, which we put in um, the, the guidelines revision as well, which depicts the intracellular uh, cobalamin pathway. And I'm sure you're very much familiar with it. I just wanted to illustrate that um, the pathway of cobalamin actually runs from, from the gut uptake into the bloodstream and then into the cell um, along a lot of different proteins and, and, and genes which are involved until um, the cobalamin molecule actually enters the mitochondria, where it serves as a cofactor of the methylmalonyl-CoA mutase enzyme, which is defective in the case of MMA. And just the reaction, uh, once they're proximal to that, um, is defective in the case of propionic acidemia. When we look at this pathway a little bit more in detail, we see again here the cobalamin arriving into the mitochondria. And then when we look a little bit more in detail at this propionate pathway, we see that it starts with certain amino acids, propionate derived from gut bacteria and other sources, and that there is an accumulation of certain metabolites here in case of a block at the pathway at this stage, in the case of PA, or when there is a block at this stage of the pathway, in the case of MMA. So what's the basis of our revision? There was an original guideline published in 2014 by uh, Baumgartner et al. And since then, um, six to seven years ago, newly published evidence has become available. And we tried to make sure to include all this novel evidence. And I'm gonna point out a few important things which we've included now in this revision. And the whole aim and purpose of these guidelines is, of course, to enable well-informed decisions in the context of PA, MMA and PA patient care and management. We had a panel of 21 um, experts, and we've tried to be as inclusive as possible, um, but it ended up to be <laughs> quite Europe and US-centric. But still, we had quite a diverse panel, also background-wise. So we had medical doctors, but we also had biochemists and dietitians and psychologists. And we also had external reviewers. So during the process um, of the guidelines, there was continuous review by seven external experts, and very importantly, also two patient representatives to include the very important patient perspective. I briefly would like to touch on the new evidence. So only a few examples on what evidence is actually brand new and was included in these guidelines. And there are two aspects which I would like to point out. There is other new evidence, of course, especially experimental evidence, which was not very much included. We focused on the evidence, which is directly patient related. And I will come to that a little bit later. But the first aspect, the first bulk of information, which had a lot of novel evidence, was the aspect of transplantation outcomes in MMA and PA patients, just two examples of uh, quite fresh papers. And secondly, I want to point out the impact of using precursor-free amino acids in both disorders, where we had some new papers coming out as well, and I'm just giving three examples here. In terms of methodology, what is new there? Um, previously, in the initial guidelines, 2014, the approach sign, the sign method was, was used for evidence evaluation, while we have now switched over to the GRADE methodology. Without going into the details of, of these acronyms, you need to understand that this is a structured, formal process, how to approach a bulk of literature and evidence, and how to evaluate it and grade it. So because we used a new method, we did a complete reanalysis of the whole body of evidence. So we did not only include the literature from 2014 up until the start of the guidelines revision, but we actually included um, uh, all the evidence which is available um, from the beginning. And then what is new method-wise as well, this is part of the great methodology, is that it is outcome-oriented. And I would like to show you how we did that. With review, continuous review of the patient representatives, we have developed a list of patient-relevant outcomes. 
and they are listed here in this diagram. And they were also rated. They were rated by the panelists, by the expert panel, but also by the patient representatives in terms of how important they are um, to the patients. And as you can see, we tried to um, group the outcomes into meaningful um, entities and to then also structure the guideline paper according to these patient relevant outcomes. You can see that survival was rated very highly and some others were rated like intermediary and the least important uh, um, outcomes were um, hematological complications and bone health. But it was important for us to see that the guideline panels or the experts saw the importance of most of these uh, outcome parameters in a similar way as in dark blue, the patient representatives. How did we approach the literature evaluation then as the next step? So we performed a PubMed research, which yielded an initial bulk of one and a half thousand um, um, publications. We then performed several um, detailed steps of um, filtering those uh, uh, papers. So first we filtered for only papers on MMA and PA, then for papers with clinical data, then for patients which, uh, or for papers which had at least three pat patients included, um, then only papers which were outcome relevant, and some papers didn't have enough uh, information in there, so they were excluded as well. And then these were um, put into these different groups according to the outcomes, and then we had working groups working on these specific outcomes with the literature which is derived from here. Some papers, of course, were in several groups at the same time, and they have been evaluated according to the grade method. The aim was then for these working groups to come out with recommendations, and they were structured according to these outcomes, and we finally came up in the guidelines with only 21 recommendations, which is, about, which is about a third of the initial 60 statements, which was in the original guidelines. And the reason is we only formulated recommendations if there is enough supporting evidence and if there is a consensus among the panelists. This doesn't mean we did not include certain controversial points, but we then discussed them in the text of the guidelines. So you should not only look at the recommendations there, but also at the text. So I want to give you a brief glimpse at the guidelines um, with two examples. One example is early diagnosis as an outcome. And there I'm going to talk briefly about newborn screening. And then another second very important outcome was metabolic stability. And there I'm going to touch on organ transplantation. So newborn screening, what is there in terms of new evidence? There are some technical um, findings which were new, but more importantly, um, some studies investigated um, the benefits of, of newborn screening and came up with two main points, that presymptomatic diagnosis of late onset patients is possible in newborn screening, and potentially um, newborn screening can prevent neonatal mortality. On the other hand, other studies found that it still may be too late for new to avoid metabolic uh, decompensation, and there is no improvement of important outcomes, for example, cognitive development. So this was a very controversial discussion among the panelists as well, and that's why there is no specific recommendation, but a long discussion in the text about the pros and cons regarding newborn screening. Then I'd briefly like to talk about metabolic stability. This is defined in our work because it's used very often, but we had to define it very specifically as the absence of hospitalization and the exacerbation of disease signs and symptoms, especially metabolic acidosis and hyperammonemia. And the opposite term would be metabolic decompensation. And there we recommend very basic things, such as we recommend avoiding catabolic metabolism, of course, to improve metabolic stability, which was not controversial and had very strong evidence. And then we also discussed organ transplantation. To give you a first impression, which organs are most frequently transplanted in MMA and PA? The liver is quite frequently transplanted in MMA and PA, a combination in MMA and very rarely only kidney in MMA. Benefits of organ transplantation is decrease of metabolic decompensations and hospital admissions, improvement of biochemical markers. Disadvantages are um, neurological complications cannot be avoided in all cases, and there is still the possibility of lethal metabolic decompensations. So overall, this topic was quite controversial, but we still came up with um, a recommendation because the benefits 
seem to be very clearly there from the evidence. And we recommended to consider liver transplantation in MMA, MMA and PA and combined liver kidney transplantation in MMA to improve metabolic stability. If you would like to read more about the, the discussions we had and about the recommendations, I would like to point you to the actual paper, which came out earlier this year, and it's open access and everybody is free to look at it. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to give you an insight how we move on to find novel evidence in terms of disease mechanisms and then potentially novel targets as well. Because based on the revision of the um, guidelines, it was very clear that there are still big holes in terms of knowledge and big holes in terms of um, sufficient patient management strategies. So we performing, we are performing a, a, a project at the moment, which is entitled Integrated Transomic Analysis of a Rare Inborn Error of Metabolism, which is MMA. I'm going to start with a study overview. So we have a group of 80 control individuals and fibroblast cells, and we have 150 patients and their fibroblasts. Based on this material and this information, we generated different omics layers. And we started off by whole genome sequencing to generate genomics data, added transcriptomics and proteomics layers, and for a subset of cells, we also performed metabolomics. And we combined these um, big data sets with the already available clinical information, as well as biochemical information. I'd just like to show you here briefly the pathway again, with which you're very familiar with, but this becomes important later on in this presentation. And then the aim of the study is to integrate all these different data layers by mostly bioinformatics method. I'm just giving a few examples here. They should be just there as an example. We performed many other things as well. And the aim is to identify, district, identify dysregulated pathways in MMA, which might, will improve disease understanding and potentially offer novel therapeutic targets. The first layer we looked at was, of course, the genomics layer. The first aim was just to confirm um, that there are biallelic and disease-causing variants in the mutase gene. And as you can see, we sol we've solved almost all of them. For some, we even uh, combined the transcriptomic layer already with the genomics layer. And we came up with this um, distribution of all the mutations on the mutase gene. Um, many of these mutations are well-known and well-characterized as for example, this one and some others are um, uh, less well known and less frequent as well. But this was not the aim of the study, of course, but this was kind of the starting point. We then went on to combine the genomics layer with transcriptomics and proteomics in an analysis which is called multi-omics factor analysis. And there you can find factors and then identify certain pathways which are driving a certain factor and then go back to the initial data sets and look where are these pathways which are driving this factor? And when we look at this, something very interesting stands out. And that is that the TCA cycle comes up as dysregulated many, many times in the transcriptomics data set, as well as in the proteomics data set, where also respiratory electron transport and ATP synthesis comes up as dysregulated. So we have first hint and this is, of course, um, expected if you know the MMA pathway. But even with this untargeted, unsupervised method, the, um, the results were pointing towards dysregulated TCA. So in a very naive way, we first looked at TCA proteins and genes and looked if they're dysregulated just by naively looking at them individually. And this is a very um, simple plot just depicting a few um, of the TCA and, and uh, associated proteins and genes. Um, there are many more, but I'm just showing you this snapshot. And in mutase, you see very clearly that there is a tendency that controls have higher transcript levels as, as well as higher protein levels compared to the mutase deficient samples here in red. So we hope to find similar obvious dysregulations or disturbances in the other proteins on, and genes, but we did not. So it's very clear that there is no clear tendency at, to, to see which protein or gene uh, is driving the TCA cycle uh, uh, changes. With other uh, untargeted methods, uh, such as PCA analysis, 
Um, for example, there is no grouping in the transcriptomics data set and proteomics data set, which made us uh, clear that the data set is actually quite homogeneous. It might be due to the use of fibroblast cells, but we could, we could also discuss that, of course. And then with other untargeted analysis, just uh, by, by looking at the protein correlation plot, um, here on the left, you see again the mutase deficient samples versus the control samples. There is no clear grouping, no clear tendency when you look at relative protein expression, when you look at absolute protein expression, when you, for example, also look at peptide length, etc. So we tried to find certain driving factors uh, to see whether there is any separation of these two groups, but there was not. So we had to find a way to look at the omics data in a more sophisticated or a more specific and detailed way. And the obvious data layer to go back to to find such driving um, um, markers is, of course, the phenotypic layer. So within our data set, we have a lot of markers from the phenotype. So we have over 100 markers. And I'm just showing in this, in this uh, graph a few examples. And we went to see whether we, can, whether we can identify one of these markers as uh, a disease correlate and as a marker of disease severity. And this marker could then be used again to compare to the omics data set. So the first thing we did is just an overall correlation plot. And you can already see that some of these biochemical or, or some of these phenotypic markers cluster very positively together, or some of them go negatively together. And we were hoping to find one single marker which uh, correlates well with many, many of these other phenotypic variables to sort of find a representative marker. And we did this by exactly doing this, namely compare every single variable against all the other variables, calculate correlations, and then plot the p-values in these histograms. And I'm going to explain it by pointing to this positive control. So this is a clinical score we've made up based on some of these phenotypic traits. So this one is expected to be very strongly correlated with all these other variables. On the x-axis, you see the p-values. So on the left-hand side, you see the p-values, which are very strongly significant. And here you have a lot of significant p-values because on the y-axis, you see the count. So whenever you had a certain p-value, it was falling into one of these bins. And um, when a bin is very high, then it means a lot of p-values are in this bin. So this is the positive control as expected, showing a lot of uh, very strongly significant p-values. When we look at these other variables, then none of them had a similar picture except for this one. Um, and this is uh, an assay which we use in the lab, which is uh, called PI assay, propionate incorporation assay. And I'm briefly going to explain uh, what this assay exactly measures and why it might be a very good disease uh, correlate. This brings me to the pathway slide. And I've introduced it when I talked about the guidelines, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But of course, you see again the mutase enzyme, which is defective in these 150 patients. It requires the adenosyl cobalamin cofactor derived from intracellular cobalamin. But very importantly, um, the propionyl CoA pathway or the propionate pathway funnels into the TCA cycle. It's very closely related to the TCA cycle. So, what happens in this assay, the PI assay? We use 14C labeled propionate, which funnels into this pathway. And the 14C atoms actually go through this pathway, overcome the mutase reaction, go into the TCA cycle, then leave the TCA cycle again by a cataporotic reaction and finally get incorporated into 14C labeled proteins. The overall reaction is um, expressed as PA, PI activity, so propionate incorporation activity. And this measure was used um, in our further analysis to investigate um, how these TCA proteins and genes maybe can be specifically identified um, uh, with, and, and point us towards specific dysregulated aspects in MMA. First of all, I just would like to show you a nice illustration how we compared the propionate incorporation activity to the other phenotypic traits. And this is shown on this slide with the volcano plot. It's actually rather simple. On the, on the right-hand side, you see 
phenotypic traits which are high in methylmalonic aciduria. On the left-hand side, you see traits which are low in methylmalonic aciduria. And this is based on using the pathway activity in a, in, a, in a regression model. And I just would like to point out a few things um, which you're very familiar with if you're uh, managing these patients, but it's just nicely that almost all these uh, variables actually run as expected. Patients with MMA more frequently had acidosis while they had low pH and low base success. They had a low GFR while they had high MMA plasma levels. And here also I would like to point out that the protein mutase level also was low in MMA as well as the transcript level in, in, um, of, of the mutase gene. So all these phenotypic variables, they run according more or less to our expectation. And um, we then used this parameter to combine the information from the PI activity assay in a differential expression analysis with the other omics layers. And there, finally, we could find not only a broad um, uh, indication that TCA cycle associated or direct TCA, TCA cycle proteins might be dysregulated, but actually we found specific players by using the PI, PI activity as a, a phenotypic trait. Here again, things on the right-hand side, proteins on the right-hand side are high in MMA, proteins on the left are low in MMA. And you see as a control, the mutase protein, which is low as, as, as shown before in this uh, DEA. And then finally we find, for example, OGDH, which is strongly dysregulated as well as GLUT1. We were, of course, very excited to see um, these TCA cycle proteins very strongly dysregulated. But then, of course, the question is, where are these proteins situated? And this brings me to, to the summary slide. And on this summary slide, maybe you were wondering before why I was already drawing uh, the glutamine um, anaplerotic pathway here. And this is, of course, because these two proteins we've just identified, they're strongly dysregulated according to our analysis in MMA. This is maybe something we also um, partly expect from other studies performed in patients um, and also common knowledge where glutamine levels are often low, especially in a crisis of an MMA patient. Um, but the question is, how do we validate this data now? So we only saw that they are dysregulated, but we want to see whether these enzymes are actually changed and whether the flux is changed. So follow-up studies include direct enzymatic assessment of these two proteins in, in cell-based models, and then also to perform metabolic flux studies by uh, labeled glutamine to see how much is the contribution of this pathway when we compare disease versus non-disease, and potentially then come up with this uh, pathway as a novel target. I briefly like to acknowledge um, all the people involved in this, in this uh, big work. It includes a um, uh, group of distinguished analysts who helped me with this, this work, um, and then several centers distributed in Switzerland, mostly in Zurich, but as well as in Geneva, um, who helped with mostly data generation as well as, as analysis. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take your questions and discuss certain aspects of our work. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, many of the questions here uh, refer to the transplant uh, talk. So, um, uh, but uh, we'll keep them for the panel discussion. I think one that is maybe relevant for the with the guidelines uh, in talking about avoiding catabolism in MMA or PA patients is the one asking about uh, how sensitive or worried are we in MMA patients for the catabolic effects of steroid therapy. Would you want to make a comment on that? Mm -hmm. This was even explicitly mentioned, the steroid therapy aspect in the first guidelines. Um, since then, there is not much novel evidence on this topic. And I think we did not include um, any, certainly not a recommendation, and we did not discuss this at length in the new guidelines revision. And um, there is just not a lot of data on this, uh, on this subject in the literature. 
Thank you. Um, then I, I, I was we were surprised to see this this um, agreement between the panelists and the patient representatives and the importance of early diagnosis and the uh, recommendation about newborn screening. Having met many patients with very devastating presentations of cobalamin A, B, or milder MAT MMA, um, I was wondering about that discussion. <laughs> Um, yeah, the discussion was was indeed quite co controversial. Uh, we felt as as, a, as an overall panel that uh, potentially the late onset patients might even benefit the most um, yeah. because the very severely early presenting patients, for them, the newborn screening result might be uh, available too late. Um, but for the late onset patients to um, avoid complications in their future, um, that might be the biggest benefit of, of newborn screening, but um, the, the discussion was too controversial to finally come up with a with a with a smooth uh, recommendation and clear recommendation. Also, the literature is not that clear on on newborn screening outcomes. And also, the nice table with the protein and energy requirements uh, was removed from this updated guidelines. I guess new information was even more confusing, or to make a clear. Uh, commit to a certain amount of protein or use of special formulas to, to recommend? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we at some points refer back to the initial guidelines if there hasn't, if there hasn't been any changes. Um, and the reason we did not come up with uh, a very specific dietary management plan is, again, the, the evidence is not clear enough. We know certain um, um, aspects which need to be considered, including the use of precursor-free amino acid mixtures, which we discussed quite at length in the guidelines. But to then really recommend um, uh, a general uh, scheme in terms of protein intake um, I think that was not possible. We opted for the recommendation to tailor it individually to the patient's needs and to the patient's uh, biochemical surveillance um, parameters and uh, clinical parameters. So that was sort of the in-between we, we chose with dietary recommendations. You will see there are some additional questions on that in the chat. Maybe we can answer or type an answer live. Uh, you want to comment on this the, the Krebs cycle regulation that comes up in the mass models in the cell studies. You validated this now with this great data set of uh, human cell lines. Do we use uh, uh, anaplerotic agents in citrate? Is that commonly or recommended? Okay. No, it's not commonly used. Um, there has been a study a couple of years ago which trialed three different anaplerotic substances, including uh, citrate, as you mentioned. Um, I think the effects on the clinical phenotype are not clear yet. Um, this needs to be seen in potential future studies. But as you say, the biochemical and, and sort of scientific evidence of several models point towards a disturbed TCA cycle, including anaplerotic reactions. So this is a potential target, we think. Um, there was a question about the checking B12 responsiveness. Um, uh, in patients, I know you have done a lot of the molecular work in the variants and their response. So and there is a protocol of how to test responsiveness. Yes, yes there is a protocol which has been uh, suggested already 2008, and we recapitulate and, and summarize the, um, the protocol to test patients for B12 responsiveness also in the guidelines revision. And we think regardless of, of the molecular um, diagnosis, like the detected variants, I think every, every patient should still be evaluated for B12 responsiveness clinically. Is there a more specific question about the DCA regulation? Uh, does it act as a regulated operon with mRNA as well as protein reduced? Yeah, um, the TCA dysregulation, we're just about to explore in more detail. Um, we, coming back to the question whether, how the mechanism of regulation takes place and also maybe even more basic, where does the regulation happen? Like on the transcriptome or the proteome level or only in terms of uh, regulation of enzymatic activity? Um, we actually don't know consistently. We don't even find consistent findings throughout the different data layers. 
which is just reflecting how complex biology is. But we certainly find with different orthogonal methods that um, the, the TCA cycle and anaplerotic reactions are clearly uh, affected in MMA. Thank you, Patrick. Again, we can type in maybe some answers in the Q&A so that we address the audience uh, questions. And with that, I will uh, introduce our next, the last speaker of this morning session, uh, Alessandro Luciani, who is a senior scientist in the Institute of Physiology and at the University of Zurich, uh, Switzerland, again. And he will present his work on mitophagy, the mitochondrial self-eating process in the pathophysiology of uh, MMA renal disease. So we'll hear from Alessandro next. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much to the organizer. And it's a really privilege to be here. I'm going to talk to you in the next 25 minutes about the role of mitophagy in methylmalonic acidemia. Mitochondria are intracellular organs that play a key role in the production of ATP, in the regulation of diverse anabolic catabolic uh, um, process, and in maintenance of several calcium and rod redox homeostasis. They also establish a network of interaction with other intracellular organelles where exchange of ions, metabolites, and other macromolecules uh, um, take place, yet they also uh, serve as central hoops that coordinate signaling cascade that toggle the balance between cell survival and death pathway. Therefore, maintaining mitochondrial integrity and function is crucial for cellular and organism homeostasis. The dysregulation of mitochondrial uh, network may uh, therefore confer a potential devastating vulnerability to many cell types, contributing to a broad spectrum of human disease. Such mitochondrial dysfunction can stem from uh, um, energy defects in the mitochondrial localized protein and orangeine, as exemplified uh, by methylmalonic acidemia. As many of you may know, this disease is caused by loss of function mutation in the mute uh, gene encoding for a mitochondria methylmalonic uh, coenzyme A mutase that is involved in the uh, branch amino acid uh, and uh, lip certain lipid metabolism. The loss, um, the complete loss or partial loss of mute uh, enzyme function leads to uh, an accumulation of toxic metabolite uh, within the matrix of uh, mitochondria network, uh, leading to morphological and functional alteration in mitochondria, ultimately causing severe organ dysfunction that affect primarily brain, liver, and kidney. As a um, uh, mute enzyme is robustly uh, expressed within mitochondria of kidney tube cells, we this and be our group um, working on kidney disease, we decide to investigate the uh, functional property of mitochondria in kidney tube cells derived uh, from urine of either healthy or MMA patient cells. As you can see here, uh, those MMA cells perfectly recapitulate the metabolic uh, signature associated with methylmalonic acidemia, as you can see by increasing level of uh, toxic metabolites. Uh, transmission electromicroscopy analysis uh, revealed that mitochondria, which appear as an interconnecting and elongating meshwork of organelles, were, in, were fragmented and characterized by a uh, rod-like shape with a perturbed crystal organization in MMA cells and confocal uh, imaging of mitochondria uh, targeted green fluorescent proteins and semi-automated image analysis confirm the morphological abnormal mitochondria in MMA cells. These ultrastructure change were uh, um, uh, parallel by an increase in the numbers of mitochondria, 
as uh, visualized by monoplot analysis of overall mitochondrial proteins and by quantifying the ratio between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA and me by measuring the, uh, the numbers of ATP5 be a flag in mitochondria, suggesting that the multifacency leads to accumulation of MMA affecting the mitochondria. Consistent with the increased number of abnormal mitochondria, membrane potential of these organelles was uh, uh, drastically collapsed as uh, testified <clears throat> by the uh, mitochondrial dye uh, tetramethylrhodamine that readily accumulate within functional mitochondria. A CO's metabolic flux analysis measuring the consumption of oxygen uh, confirmed impairment in the mitochondria uh, based uh, bioenergetic profile as shown by decreased basal uh, respiration, uh, mitochondria derived ATP production and maximum respiration. And these cellular defects were um, complemented by a major production of mitochondrial oxidative stress as testified by live cell imaging of a bona fide uh, mitochondria, a bona fide reporter of mitochondrial uh, ROS. And this change ultimately leads to uh, an increased production of lipocalin, a protein that is released by kidney cells following oxygen stress and cellular uh, damage. Uh, analogous to human cells, um, we were able to uh, observe similar uh, defects such as metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction in mouse kidneys and the right proximal tubule cells carrying a knock-in allele um, uh, knocking a little um, corresponding to a known patient mutation and a um, knockout mutation on a second allele. To further explore the consequence of uh, mood deficiency in vivo, we uh, generated the first zebrafish mood model of mood deficiency uh, by using CRISPR gene editing technology. We obtained one uh, mutant zebrafish carrying an 11 base pair CRISPR induced deletion that result in a premature stop codon within the exon 3 that leads to a truncated protein deprived of uh, uh, enzymatic activity. Uh, the homozygous mutant zebrafish, which looks normal, display no obvious uh, development defects, uh, display an accumulation of MMA metabolites which were planted by uh, introducing the wild type enzyme in the liver. So supporting the concept of, and the, 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 uh, the efficiency of the gene uh, deletion strategy. Uh, similar to uh, several defects seen in uh, patient cells and mouse uh, kidney um, of uh, no knockout mice, uh, both liver and kidney of mutant zebrafish display abnormal mitochondria uh, characterized by an increased uh, circularity and uh, perturbed crystal organization. These um, uh, ch cellular change were parallel by MP, uh, mitochondria driven bioenergetics as uh, uh, testified by CEOs metabolic flux analysis in a mutant uh, zebrafish. And those change were parallel by a major production of mitochondrial oxidative stress as shown by uh, um, uh, in vivo imaging and and a rastrometric flash microscopy based um, analysis of glutal to redox fluorescent um, signal in uh, mitochondria of liver uh, mutant zebrafish. So, suggesting the evolutionary con conservation of this connection. Furthermore, 
um, the uh, mutant zebrafish swim over shorter distance and display excessive mortality, which were planted by feeding the mutant zebrafish with a low molecular uh, with a, with a low protein diet, and um, uh, by expressing the wild type enzyme in the in the liver of the mutant zebrafish. We came to the conclusion that the, the absence of the mutant enzyme and the resulting uh, accumulation of toxic metabolites super the mitochondria uh, or network homeostasis function leading to uh, epithelial stress and, and tissue damage. The question remains how mechanistically uh, the absence of mutant enzyme uh, trigger uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction and hence the tissue damage. Recent studies have um, brought forward the idea that uh, an evolutionary conserved process called lead autophagy can selectively remove uh, damaged mitochondria, thereby acting as a cytoprotective system. And as autophagy maintains the quality control of cells and organelles, we hypothesize that mitochondrial dysfunction induced by uh, the, the absence of the mutant sign may reflect any change in autophagy pathway. So therefore, we decided to uh, measure autophagy by quantifying the, um, the conversion of non-lipidated uh, form of LC31 to the autophagous associated form of LC32, and by quantifying the number of lc 3 flagged autophagosomes in cells treated with the bufilomycin, a well-established lysosome based inhibitor that block the degradation of autophagosome that subsequently accumulate. Compared to control uh, cells, um, MMS cells display an increase of LC3-1 to LC3-2 conversion uh, and then high numbers of LC3 flagged uh, mitochondria, um, autophagus, I'm sorry. Um, furthermore, treatment with, um, with, uh, with, um, with the bufilomycin uh, increase the, the level of LC32 at high numbers of, um, of LC3 uh, decorated autophagus at two different time points uh, where any change um, uh, reflect alteration in autophagosome per genesis. It has been shown that any intracellular and extracellular cues damage uh, the mitochondria, leading to um, fragmentation of the tubular networks. After that, uh, mitophagy receptors or ubiquitin autophagy adapters uh, are recruited and activated at the surface of the mitochondria, damaged mitochondria, and this leads to uh, uh, subsequent recruitment of other autophagy core proteins that initiate the formation of a phagophore. Uh, organel that starts surrounding the damaged mitochondria. Once the phagophore close to form autophagosome, the uh, damaged mitochondria are engulfed and targeted to the lysosome for the final degradation. So given the persistence of fragmented uh, mitochondria, high numbers of, um, of, of autophagosome in patient cells, we hypothesize that the absence of mutant enzyme may uh, therefore skew the disgradition of MMA damage to mitochondria. Uh, to verify our hypothesis, we treated the both healthy and patient cells with sublethal concentration of rotenone to damage mitochondria and selectively activate the mitochondria, uh, the mitophagy uh, uh, driving degradation of damaged mitochondria. And as you can see in panel A and B, uh, after 24 hours of treatment with the rotenone, uh, control cells display decreased number 
of, uh, of mitochondria and decreased ratio between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear, uh, and nuclear DNA. Why? Both parameters were uh, retained in MML cells, suggesting that the multifiscency may uh, skew the degradation of MMA damaged mitochondria in MML cells. Uh, we went a, first, a step farther and utilized um, ratiometric pH insensitive imaging based assay to follow the delivery of um, uh, mitochema tagged mitochondria uh, to autophagy lysosomal degradative compartment. So when dysfunctional mitochondria are engulfed within, uh, within auto uh, lysosome, uh, a green to red shift of, uh, in mitochema proteins occur, owing to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to low pH in uh, this degradative compartment. So we similarly express mitochema in both healthy and patient cells and treat those cells with low um, sublethal concentration of rotenone to uh, follow up the delivery of mitochondria to the lysosome. After 24 hours of treatment, um, uh, control cells expectedly uh, display a red, uh, green to red sheath, as you can see here in the micrograph image, and as you can see also here by quantification of mitochema red green uh, fluorescence ratio. Uh, this shift was um, surprisingly uh, blocked in MMSL, suggesting that multifiscency skewed the delivery of MMA damaged mitochondria to. Uh, lysosome. It has been shown that in mammalian cells, damage to mitochondria leads to the stabilization of uh, the protein kinases called pink one to uh, damage surface of, of mitochondria. Once there, this protein can recruit uh, another protein called parkin, which starts ubiquitinated other uh, mitochondrial proteins. Uh, at the uh, surface of uh, other membrane of mitochondria that culminate with engulfment of uh, damaged mitochondria within autophagy lysosomal degradative compartment. And given the reduced flow um, of damaged mitochondria towards uh, the granite compartment, we hypothesize that mute deficiency may compromise the pink parking priming uh, mechanisms. Uh, to verify uh, this hypothesis, we uh, label the mitochondria of both healthy patient, patient cells uh, with uh, mitochondria targeted green fluorescent proteins and expose uh, those cells to uh, sublethal concentration of rotenone to score the translocation of parking uh, to uh, GFP flagged mitochondria. As I have told you before, uh, the translocation of parking to GFP flagged mitochondria is a bona fide reporter of uh, pink parking uh, uh, priming mechanism activation. Uh, after four hours of treatment with the rotenone, control cells show an increase in parking cluster and translocation of parking to damaged mitochondria, while the same uh, treatment did not increase, did not increase the number of, of uh, parking structure, nor the translocation of parking to damaged mitochondria. This change were, uh, were complemented by the lack of the engulfment of damaged mitochondria within electron microscopy uh, structure compatible with autophagy vesicles, uh, suggestive of um, defective marking of diseased mitochondria uh, to uh, autophagy and lysosomal degraded compartments. We then performed um, 
uh, uh, gain and loss on function intervention that demonstrate that restoring being one at the surface of mitochondria increase the cluster, parking positive cluster, and the translocation of parking to MMA damage to mitochondria, inducing their delivery and degradation by autophagy lysosomal uh, degraded compartments, as um, testified by mitochema. Um, uh, reporters say by monoplot analysis of overall mitochondria proteins. In parallel, uh, the same genome function protocol improve uh, the mitochondrial function and also their bioenergetic profile, as you can see here, by Sears metabolic flux analysis. To demonstrate the link between mute deficiency, uh, defect mitophagy, and mitochondrial functioning, and epithelial stress and cellular damage, we decide to derive uh, proximal tubule cells from um, flux smooth um, mouse kidney and transduce those cells with an adenovirus express accretic recombinants to conditional uh, um, inactivate the functional mute gene in in vitro. Uh, the deletion of mute enzyme, which was reflected by an increased level in uh, MMR uh, metabolites, leads to reduced uh, degradation of damaged mitochondria, as you can see here by the mitochema reporter say. Uh, and those changes were paralleled by uh, generation, an increased generation in mitochondrial oxidative stress and overproduction of uh, the lipocalin 2, which uh, were both planted by restoring pink parking direct mitophagy on the surface of damaged mitochondria in mood uh, deleted uh, kidney cells. We came to the conclusion that the absence of mute enzyme and the resulting accumulation of toxic metabolite uh, um, impair the pink induced translocation of Parkin, thereby halting the delivery uh, of MMA damaged mitochondria to autophagy lysosomal uh, um, compartments. This, in turn, leads to an accumulation of damaged mitochondria uh, that uh, trigger epithelial stress and kidney damage. If mitochondrial dysfunction promoted the accumulation of uh, damaged mitochondria and cellular stress and kidney damage, any intervention that repair mitochondrial function will subsequently restore seromestasis and prevent damage in MMA uh, cells. So to explore the translational potential of this concept, we decide to treat both patients and the mutant zebrafish lab with the mitochondria um, target ROS scavengers, which are tested um, tested um, uh, recently in other uh, diseases associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. And interesting enough, uh, the treatment with, uh, with the mitotempo, which blocks the production of mitochondrial uh, oxidative stress in MS cells, improved mitochondrial morphology and their bioenergetic profiles and lowered the overproduction of lipocalin 2 in MMS cells despite any change in, uh, in MMR metabolites. Similarly, uh, MitoQ uh, treatment of uh, cow zebrafish with MitoQ, which blocks uh, the, the production of mitochondrial oxidative stress, improve uh, behavioral uh, phenotypes and planted the, um, the, the, the excessive mortality in cow uh, zebrafish independently on any change occurring in MMA metabolites. 
So if I have to summarize my talk in just one slide, I would say that we have identified a novel link between primary gene deficiency, mitophagy dysfunction, and mitochondrial alteration, and epithelial stress and kidney damage. Uh, these findings substantiate the role of Ping and Park in mitophagy in the maintenance of mitochondrial network, hence its role in maintenance. Uh, in homeostasis and function of specialized epithelial cells. Uh, we have shown that Nutka or zebrafish, which are key capitulate mitochondrial pathology and phenotypes associated with MMA, represent a powerful tool for drug discovery. And we have also demonstrated that uh, targeting damaged mitochondria with mitochondria targeted antioxidant repair the homeostasis of mitochondria and prevent damage in preclinical models of MMA. And in perspective, uh, our findings suggest that turning up mitophagy may serve as a novel therapeutic strategy in MMA disease. And with that, I would like to stop here my talk and thanks, uh, thank all the uh, contributors in Devus Lab, national and international contributors, and uh, our funding agency. Nothing was uh, possible without um, uh, these great collaborators. And I thank you so much for your, your attention. Thank you, Alessandro. That was a very nice presentation and a novel mechanism and target for, for therapies. From the submitted questions, there was a question on rapamycin that affects autophagy and would it affect the mitophagy in the same way through the pink parking signaling? Yeah, so a concern, yeah, this is a very, very, very uh, good uh, question. Um, well, I did not have time to show you our uh, complete autophagy characterization of MMA cells, but in our uh, settings, uh, I mean, in our MMA cells, we did not find any, any, any dysregulation of mTOR signaling pathway. So this is suggesting that probably uh, uh, instead of looking to rapamycin, we should look for other more specific compounds that are able to um, selectively regulate uh, the mitochondrial uh, degradation. So for instance, recently, it has been shown that um, uh, naturally occurring compounds like spermidine, for instance, resirvedatrol, for, for instance, again, and um, also urilitin A, are able to selectively uh, induce mitophagy in different diseases um, associated with uh, defective uh, mitophagy or with uh, defective mitochondria. And um, they are also able to, um, to, to prevent some disease phenotype in uh, preclinical models. For instance, if you take cancer, if you take, uh, if you take neurodegeneration, for instance, or other metabolic disease, if you give uh, these compounds to these animal models, uh, you are able to uh, re rescue some uh, disease phenotype. So just come back to your question. Yes, rapamycin, but better if you use more selective compounds acting on mitophagy. Lovely. Uh, so the, the, we have seen this increased mitochondrial mass in many tissues, humans and mice, your nice zebrafish and all of that. The number, the, there is a balance between degradation through the autophagy versus mitochondrial biogenesis. Is the biogenesis pathway upregulated or downregulated in your systems? Well, this is a very, very, very good, uh, good question. Uh, yes, the um, pool of mitochondria within cells is maintained by a balance between degradation and biogenesis. And um, several uh, studies now start pointing to the fundamental role of pink and parking, not only for degradative pathway, but also for bioenergetic, uh, biogenic pathway. Uh, it has been shown that parking as well pink uh, is able to regulate a repressor of PGC1 alpha, call it, um, um, uh, call it Paris. And uh, once uh, parking is downregulated, so the Paris protein is up, and is acting on PGF alpha, blocking the, uh, the, the, the biogenesis and the function of mitochondria. Uh, 
So uh, this, this uh, homeostatic link suggests once again that uh, actin mitophagy and specifically actin on pink and parking direct mitophagy is important not only for maintaining the quality control of mitochondria, but is also crucial for maintaining uh, the, uh, the, 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 the biogenesis and the renew of uh, mitochondria. Then uh, I was reviewing mitophagy and the reported mice, mitoQC mice. They have um, increased mitophagy in proximal versus distal tubules, which is goes well with our MMA uh -huh. observations in which uh, the cell autonomy of the proximal tubule versus uh, other parts of the nephron being affected. But they also have a lot of uh, heart involvement. Mitophagy is very uh, in, important in the cardio, cardiomyocytes. Uh, it has always puzzled us this uh, more normal heart physiology in MMA. Any insights from the mitophagy uh, work? Um, yeah, so, so within the mitophagy, um, within the mitophagy field, uh, yeah, if for instance, yes, if you take uh, animals uh, with um, deletion of pink and parkin, okay, uh, and uh, check for um, uh, defects of mitochondria in cardiac or muscle cells, they have problems uh, okay. because this is a general pathway working, yeah. yes. This is a general pathway working uh, in uh, in mitochondrial uh, maintenance. So if you take pink one or parking uh, knockout mice, they have problem with with the uh, with the heart. Yes, they show cardio cardiomyopathy. They have uh, um, uh, they have yes problem with 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 the heart. Yes. Um, I think we are, have reached our lunch time, and I think it was. Uh, thank you all for this nice uh, first opening session today. We all go for a lunch break and come back at uh, twelve thirty. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>